hello and run welcome I suppose the most daunting thing about computers is this business of communicating with them. There's the machine, and I'm supposed to talk to it. I say talk, but it's more a matter of writing it little notes. You type little memos into it. Of course, there are a large number of what computer people call languages. But they don't seem much like any language we humans speak. In fact, you can never forget that you're talking to a machine. Yes, we're back with the computer program episode number three airing on the 25th of January 1982 to all good school children and anyone else who had a bit of spare time in the afternoon. As we've just been informed, this episode is called Talking to a Machine and it's based around programming the early 8-bit micros. There's the old owl. Hello mate. And we start with a steam engine. Because, like all these shows, they love to draw strange, strange comparisons to real world scenarios. Of course, this was the main form of transport in the early 80s. Ago, these steam engines and agricultural machines were in common. Along with that, today, Land Rover in the background there. Earth collectors' items, just as they make people redundant. They, in their turn, were replaced. Wow, this takes me back to my childhood. There used to be loads of these steam fairs around with Norfolk. But even so, outdated as they are, we can still see at work in them the same principles on which much of today's computer technology is based. They're not really steam organs at all. But it was the steam engine which drove the generator, which powered the pump, which produced the air, which made the music. That sounds like an, a nursery rhyme. Is the power of the air. It sounds like I've swallowed the fly. I know an old lady who swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. Morbid. He looked very excited, doesn't he, old Ian McNaught Davis? Or Mac? As his friends call him. Of course, I'm not his friend. But I used to always find those automated music machines quite creepy. Absolutely magic. Brilliant. You know, if I could get it in my living room... Look at that kid's 80s Rain Mac. That is nice. And that guy on the left, he looks like Rolf Harris. It would churn out music... I think he heard me. ...hours a day, seven days a week. It would churn it out in any style you wanted or any tune you wanted, providing you knew how to program it. And this was a secret. Punched card. A pattern of holes in a piece of cardboard. And it's the placing of these holes in their exact positions which ensures the organ plays this piece and not the national anthem. One of my favourite storage mediums. Oh, Fairground in an 80s dangerous place to be. I know you fell out of a fairground ride that went upside down in the 80s. That was unbelievably scary. One of those mobile ones which comes to your town. Good God. Well, tell us Tim, how does it work? Well, I'll try I love the patches on his elbows. A round steel piece here, which sends the holes in the cardboard news. When a key is up, it operates an air valve inside the box here, which transmits an air signal through the tubes into the other mechanical part of the organ. Uh, would you like to see how these? Very clever. He looks like he's dressed out like one of the people from uh, Bertha, the children's TV show. There, there's the drum stop there. See number. That one there, 55. Nice. If I push this down now, and you move that up and down, like that. And it's a drum. <laughs> That's a nice drum. That's Not too bad. It's very simple, it's a sort of early form of binary. It's very it's clever how it all groups together into one small area. Very simple. Uh, when the key is up, the music plays. Simple as that. He's fascinated. I would be. <laughs> I really like it. The, uh, it's like those people are creepy. What's Chris up to? Music of a very different kind from the annex of the Science Museum, the bit the public never see. It's an absolute treasure house of redundant technology. Now that would be a fun place to go. It's a Japanese kamikaze rocket. I suppose it's the sort of executive jet they give to redundant Japanese executives. <laughs> well, <laughs> 
flashing lights and... Bad taste? I'm not entirely sure. Is that right? Yeah, it's a bit of an oldie, but it's still a computer. Now, it's making music. Does that mean... I always get the feeling that Mac is intensely patronising to Chris. Lanford Forum do it. Curiously enough, there is, and I can show you it. It's, uh, it's a little bit surprising. If you look at this little device here, you remember the cards with all those holes cut in it? Mm. Sounds like the background sound from the Nostromo. On, the, on those boards that went through the old steam organ, these represent the holes, these little plugs. They're actually ferrite plugs. And where there's a one, that's an on, and where there isn't one, that's an off. And each one of these running right across wow. represents instructions. That's one, two, three, four, and so on. Each one of these, there's 24 across here, 24 on-offs, which gives you a possibility of 16 million combinations of instructions. And that's not much different to a CD-ROM, really, just scaled going through the steam organ. And this is telling scaled up exactly what it should do. I always find it's good to go back to basics to find out how things work now. It's always good to look back in history. <laughs> I mean, if anybody had to program like this, there'd be, there'd be no programmers left. It's impossible. Um, it's not like that anymore, thank goodness. And even this machine has some help to, to help you sort them out, but very, very little. And this is obviously not just designed for making music, is it? No, well, it's a general purpose computer, but this particular one was programmed to run uh, a pneumonia plant, and it took temperature sensing devices which converted a what a pneumonia a ammonia fed it all into a series of programs and these controlled the sent messages out to control the valves that ran the whole plant ah 80s background music love it It still seems a very long way from what we think of as the modern computer with its keyboard and its television set. Are they really that different? Well, the idea is very similar. In that Argus, there was a program running in the machine that would check whether I touched any switches on the front. And in this, there's one running as well. There's a program in here. Well, what most people think of as a program, surely, is a set of instructions in the computer which say, do this, do that. In other words, making it do something. Well, as far as I can see, it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. <laughs> well, it isn't exactly switched off because... Well, we're in the computer. That's a nice effect. ...means it's switched on. But in addition to that, there is a program running in there which is continuously checking whether somebody has actually pressed a key on the keyboard, and it's running all the time. Does that mean there's a little sort of electric current running backwards and forwards saying... Single-tasking computer. Run again, key pressed, no, and uh, like that. Is that what it's Well, doing? it's not an electric current, but the idea is very similar. And I've got something I'd really like to show you because it's very much like your doorbell at home has broken down. You're expecting friends with their arms full of good cheer. How do you know when they've arrived at the door? They'd probably knock, Mac. Oh, he seems a bit anxious, doesn't he? <laughs> just, just go and do something, Chris. Well, that's very clear. The machine is constantly looking to see if anybody's uh, there or not, and if they're not, they go back and keep checking. Are all computers like that? No, some actually operate more like as if you had a doorbell. In other words, as you'd be sitting at home doing something else, but subconsciously listening for the bell to ring, and as soon as they rang the bell, you'd go to the door and see if anyone was there. Some programs work like that, or some computers work. It's more like our multitasking systems work computer at that time now when you press a key i imagine a kind of electronic version of your marvelous steam organ where you know a metal prong goes through there and says ah circuit a open and ah, now you press a so it's been through all this process little pipes and wires and up comes a on the screen now is that anything like accurate <laughs> no there is no connection at all between the screen and what uh, between the keyboard and what's appearing on the screen and i think i can show well, you i mean there is demonstration program here and all it does is put, I am busy on the screen. So there's now another program running inside this computer in right. here. And so the program that services the keyboard is no longer running. And you can see that because if I touch the keyboard, it doesn't do anything. Well, that's, I mean, you're absolutely stuck now. If, that, if that's going to go on forever, I mean, how do you stop it? Well, fortunately, we have a doorbell, or equivalent of a doorbell, and we press escape, which is the doorbell, press it, and it stops. And we're back now to the program that's asking the keyboard, has anybody pressed a key? So if you press a key now, it'll come up on the screen? It will come right on the screen. Right. Now, what is it exactly that happens when, between the time I press that key 
and the letter comes up, something happens in here. Well, it's quite complex. First of all, you hit a key, it will then store that character, uh, there'll be a program in there that's checking whether a character's there. If I wonder how much school kids understood of this. That in its turn will determine where it's going to go on the screen, whether it goes here or further along, whether it's overlapped and should go on the next line. It's quite a complex sequence of... I remember when we first had a BBC micro in infant school, when they brought it in to run Logo, and I was amazed by it. a second to do that. As quickly as that. It's very, very rapid. So deep down in this machine's subconscious, I mean, planted there, is the message, make A on the screen, which we only have to, which we just have to call it's up. It's all very mysterious, wasn't it? Totally routine. It just goes on it must and have... on. And I was like... It surprises me how people, how kids could not be interested in this. One instruction. It's almost like... So this mysterious box of electronics. They have quite complex things to do, but you can give one command and make them all turn or halt or whatever. And each soldier has planted deep down in his consciousness something that has been drilled to do. Exactly that he, what he wants, what he has to do in that sequence. Except the soldier has a rifle. Escort! Oh, and a large furry bear on his head. Just carrying the military analogy a little bit farther, if I give you a command, shoot at a target, as a trench soldier, you'd know exactly what to do. Right, yes, I mean, it just happens by an amazing coincidence. <laughs> God, he's got a oh, rifle in the, yeah, in the yeah, office. I know what you mean. It just happens by amazing well, coincidence. Well, I've got a shotgun. Command, like, <laughs> into three sort of routines. Obviously, it's not a shotgun. Aim and fire, and they're all of them quite complicated. Loading means opening that, stick a bullet in there, close it up again. With he knows how to use it with quite incredible proficiency as well. Yeah, there's nothing in it, but let's not take any chances. Lining up the target with the two sights on the front and back of the gun, looking through and making sure that it's all. Like I wonder that. if the end of a series. Firing part is another muscular activity which is pulling the trigger. Chris actually shoots Mac. Satisfied that everything's lined for being up. so utterly patronising. Yeah. And those are three quite complicated routines, all embodied in one very simple word: shoot at the target. In computer language, we call them subroutines, right. parts of a main routine. And perhaps I can show you if you pass me this rather large book of. Here you go, school kids. Here's a bloke with a computer using a gun. What? Sorry, what's what we mean? If you look carefully at this, you can find two pieces of this music which are very similar. There's a piece here, yes. and there's a piece down here. Right. And we can think of those, they're probably just repeats of the same refrain. Well, you could take that out and take that out, and at this point, you have an instruction which says, play this section. You've just stored it once. You couldn't really use compression software on that, could you? On the music. We could have a command which says, play refrain, and it would play the refrain here, it would play the refrain there. In other words, that was a subroutine. And by that command of saying, play refrain, we've almost started to invent a, a computer language, even for the old steam organ. Now, we've talked about language a lot, and I must admit to being quite confused by the diversity and number of computer languages. We've got a program running here which lists... I've noticed that Chris always wears the same clothes every week. I'm pretty sure he does. Pascal. There's an absolutely dazzling number of languages. Now, how on earth do we tell well, what languages are? Presumably, they're all like French, German, Spanish, and so on. How do we tell one from another? It, which oh, using your analogy of ordinary languages, for example, in, uh, in, in Eskimo, there's hundreds of names for snow because they want to talk a lot about snow. In Arabic, apparently, there's lots of names, lots of words to do with camels. And similarly, there's been attempts at computer languages to make programming easier and easier. And so many different attempts have been made, so specialised languages, general purpose languages, we end up with this terrible confusion. And which one are we using? We're going to use BASIC, and that is a very popular language. It's a popular language for people to start learning how to program. And this particular machine runs in BASIC. It's a very high-level language. Microcomputers work on BASIC, do they? Yes, they do. Almost every microcomputer would have a BASIC. And although it's the most popular, it has certain problems with it. First of all, it's very easy to make mistakes in BASIC. And secondly, there isn't really a standard BASIC that you can use on every microcomputer. They're all in some way a little bit different. If we wanted to use a different language on this, could we? Yes, there's a much more professional language called Pascal, which is a much more disciplined language. It's more um, rigorous and it's, it's more difficult to make mistakes and it's also more transportable. It's more difficult more to use. Difficult to learn. Yes, and it's, for a beginner it will be more difficult to learn. So that's why for a beginner, many of them start off in BASIC. Basic. And BASIC, which is running on our microcomputer here. Like machine code. How people program machine code is boggling. Like me. But there are other less common languages which have been designed for doing very special jobs. Jill Neville. This is what engineers call a drive shaft. Head, Jill. <laughs> and you'll find one like it in most heavy vehicles and most heavy machinery. 
Though it's a complicated shape, full of curves and angles, with a thread top and bottom, uh -huh. it can be made in just four minutes from a plain steel bar like this one. What's more, it can be made on a general purpose lathe, which could equally well be turning out bolts or pipe fittings. Modern lathes are, of course, very sophisticated pieces of machinery. Oh, did she? That's amazing how she did that. But it's only with the growing need for flexibility that they've actually been controlled by computer. But of course, you can't just stand a computer by a lathe and expect. But she to has lost to her face. necklace Someone in the process, by the look of it. To do. Peter, how do you get it across to a computer that it's now in charge of a very complicated lathe? Well, first of all, this computer, same as any other computer, Sinumeric. So it can understand it's got a lathe on the other end of it. From a simple set of instructions. I suppose she doesn't want her necklace being caught up in the lathe and having her head sucked into the machine. That wouldn't be too fun, would it? Can be made to brought into position and cut the shape required for that particular component. Uh, the tail stock can be brought in to support the work, or from the instructions. So let's go back. It looks like the reporter from Spider-Man. in my hand, and I want another one. How do I tell the computer? That that's Not Peter Parker. First of all, there's a set of instructions written. You know, the, the chief reporting jobby in the memory of the computer and the first instruction tells that Barry Norman whatever his name is that it's going to run in metric units G71 means metric M42 means a gear change so each of those is really a code for a rather specific process that's right each line or block is to do that do people wear like coats like this anymore do they wear like industrial jackets constant cutting speed like so janitor jackets being cut at a constant rate so what you've got is it safe to wear a tie using a lathe that must be tucked in of, of actions which is already stored in the memory the wonder of modern technology amazing look at that I remember using a lathe at high school. No idea what for. To make a drive shaft like this, you need a special I think we made a padlock. form of code, if you like. The language may seem strange at first, but it's easy to learn. It's a bit like logo. Locations are limited elsewhere. Here on the factory floor, it's exactly the right tool for the job. Well, controlling complicated machines like that one is something that computers are increasingly being used for. Everybody's seen film of robots putting cars together. Well, we've yes, got... been watching quite a few of those recently. I've been a bit addicted to watching films about the Austin Metro from the 80s. Wide range of movements. Now, Mac, what do I have to do with a computer to make it instruct the arm to do what I want it to do? Well, the arm is capable of 12 different sorts of movements left, right, up, down, open. Now, what I'd like to see here is if this arm went haywire, grabbed Mac, <laughs> grabbed his wrist. <laughs> Slammed him down. It is written in a kind of language that the arm but understands, and we probably wouldn't. Right. right. So that that means that's unlikely to happen. It's a little interpreter, so we can put in English. I think that shot was used in Micro Men. Okay, just uh, there. There's the beginnings of a program here. We've got to print command question mark, which is fairly. Or a very similar right. shot. I think it happens in most episodes. I mean, that's easy. It's asking you for a command. The next bit is input command string, which tells the computer to expect a string of letters which will put together a command word. Right. right. Now, what's ah. the next step? Well, the next step is to make... Chris's the knowledge is growing from episode to episode. ...subroutine that's going to make the arm do what you want it to do. For mm -hmm. example, if you want it to go up. So, it's going to be one of those if-then things, isn't that's it? Right, gonna, yes. You're going to write... The next instruction, I bet, is going to be if um, the command string equals up for instance then find the subroutine that says up right i never got the control of robot arm at school i'm very disappointed not quite but very similar so you say if the command string equals up then get the subroutine which starts at line a thousand where we've put all this code that makes the arm you could go put up. it on any line but you can start in any a thousand line. is a right. convenient size and you number. don't actually say go to subroutine you shorten that and say go sub so you just say go sub a thousand which is where the that's one of those bits of basic of language is. isn't it yeah yes. okay so the next line is going to be 30 who would have guessed it and if one of my favourite commands in BASIC used to be go to, but it's not very good. Equals, yes. not is etiquette. <laughs> it's not etiquette. Um, well, let's say uh, in, in quotes. It's not a very good command to use. 
then, very important, then... Um, go sub. Go sub, however, is much better because you can return to your place in the code. A thousand. I just write the number a thousand. One thousand, that's it. That's where that particular subroutine starts. That's its first line. Well, instead of typing them all in, we have to do one for every movement of the arm. And we've got our labour-saving <laughs> tape, <laughs> so it's all been done for us. Right, splendid. We can load this now. Let me get this right. Um, uh, and what's it called? Um, robot. In, in, oh, right. in, in, in quotes. Qu Um, start Switch the tape running and then press the return key that's and that's it's I do uh, like BBC number. basic and then it'll begin now it's beginning to read it it's very right. nice and of course it, on the cassette it's quite slow it takes a bit of time to get it in it will be a lot quicker on disc but they cost correspondingly more little right. floppy disks right and it's now actually reading through the program which is all on there and, and absorbing it into it's the reading computer once again. every one of those subroutines yeah. that uh, control the movements of the arm and also our little interpreter which we can type in commands in ordinary English which is make the arm do what we want it to do. You can see why Sinclair and other computer manufacturers must have been envious. BBC, Acorn, all into the computer. they've got their computer on main TV so every week for three months. So we can look at okay. our um, it's in the first nine lines, which is our little interpreter. Free of advertising. Amazing. No costs. Right. That's a bit more basic jargon, is it? If we said list the whole lot, we'd have all the subroutines oh, listed out. But comma instead of dash. That's it. it. Okay. And there it is. If command up, then go sub 1,000 down. Mm. Is it starts at 2,000, left starts at 3,000. Right. And so we can try it out and see if it works. Right, you can run it. Oh, great. What is your command, O oh, master? Well, let's <laughs> shall we try it on up and see what happens. Well, it works. One. Look at that. What's the next command? Left, shall we try? It's tremendous. It's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> terrific. <laughs> We've made it go. It's very gratifying. But of course, these words. No idea what to do with it, but it is impressive. Any words we like. Really? We don't have to we use could... up or left or anything. So we could just we could call the up command George or Mac <laughs> yes, or anything. Well, let's do it. Okay. We have to escape from the program and get back to where we were. So there we go. And now we should listen and see. Okay. Ten to ninety. Comma ninety. Comma ninety. Has to be, doesn't it? Right. Well, there's the command for up number 30. If we retype 30. it, right. and we can put anything We can just you retype like. it down there. Yes, it doesn't matter, it. and it'll still take... OK. Right. Um, if command string equals anything you like... Well, let's say... Arse! That's very nice. Boobies! Oh. And goes to the thousand, which is simply... He's put his friend in Mac. Mac. Subroutine, which starts... Bless him. Instruction okay. a thousand. We can run it now, can we? That's him. Run. Command. <laughs> oh, master. <laughs> what is your command, oh, master? Well, look here, arm. I want you to go Mac, M-A-C. Go. Great. It works. So I suppose what we're actually saying is that <laughs> the arm only speaks a kind of arm language, and if we speak English... Oh, preempting the arm processor there, using an acorn machine. But what we speak... Maybe that's where we got the name from. Yes, the great advantage of it is, of course, you can type anything, you, you can create it to be anything you like. You could put L there, or you could put it in French or German or anything you like. So, there we go. We finished with Goldfish Feeding Program. Yes, that's what you, you spend £5,000 on that just to feed your goldfish. Thanks for watching this episode. See you next time.